Hi friends, day 283 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. Today are some of the more difficult chapters for some people to read in the New Testament, but it's also kind of our handbook to live by. It's the Sermon on the Mount. It is all of the directives that Jesus gave. And what I wanna tell you today, how I wanna encourage you in reading this, is to just keep your heart open. An open heart and open ears to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit because he will speak to each and every one of you very differently. There will be a specific part of this sermon that will jump out at you and I encourage you to write it down and to pray about it and to meditate on it because that ultimately is what builds that relationship and that communion with God and that is what he wants. So let's not waste any time here. If you could please just hit the like button that will help out to reach other people across the world. If you're new, let us know where you are in the world because we wanna know who else is watching and from what parts of the earth. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as you have already determined it in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, everything we need, our spiritual food, the nourishment that you know is necessary for us. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Please help us to forgive those who have also sinned against us. Help us to bless them, oh God. Help us to forgive them and help us to be able to treat them well despite what our flesh wants, Lord. Help us to make things right right now, to just simply leave it at the altar so that we are able to have this unhindered relationship and communion with you in this moment. Please do not lead us into any temptation, Lord. Keep the enemy far away from us. We know that you will never give us any sort of testing or you will never allow temptation beyond what we could bear. You always give us a way to escape. And so I just pray that today, Lord, as we go throughout our day or even tomorrow, next week, whatever it is, that you will please show us where the exit trap door is. We always need to know where that way out is. And so we give you permission, Holy Spirit, to have your way, to speak to us today, to minister to our hearts. We love you so much, Jesus, and we thank you for your word today. Let us feel like we are there with you on that mount as your disciples, the little Christ, that's who we are now, the ones who are learning from you, gleaning from you, and who are going to be sent out to do a good work. And so will you minister to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. And I will try not to spend too much time on some of the things that we have already read. So here we are, the Sermon on the Mount. Remember in Luke chapter six the other day, I said this could be the same sermon or maybe a different one. You will see that there will be additional words that are spoken here included in this particular sermon that Jesus preached. Either way, it were they were his words. That's really all that matters at this point. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain because this was a natural amphitheater. It makes sense that he would preach there. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, one thing to note here is that typically sitting down would mean that he was teaching. Whenever someone was preaching, they would typically stand. So he is teaching his disciples here. But of course, the crowds came to also hear the teachings of Jesus. So the Beatitudes, this comes from the Greek word beatus, but we like to look at it as the way to have our attitudes, the way we want our attitudes to be, right? So the Beatitudes, <laughs> so how to live out your life. And he opened his mouth. That means he spoke with authority and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These three right here are referring to the emptying of oneself. It all starts right here with being poor in spirit. This is where we start with God. You cannot come to God without feeling that spiritual bankruptcy. Because ultimately, when you know that you need a savior, there is some sort of bankruptcy. There's a deficit where you are seeking that fulfillment. And that is where we all begin our relationship with him, is being poor in spirit. So this isn't a bad thing. Again, blessed are those who mourn. So then you go from being poor in spirit, receiving God or Jesus as your savior, and then mourning over your sin, which leads you to repentance. And then you gain this spirit of humility. As The more that you start to have a relationship with Jesus, the more humble you will become because you recognize how small you are in comparison to him. Being meek is seen as a bad thing to the world. To us as Christians, it's an amazing thing because meekness actually means strength under control. It is 
compared to the way that a stallion, a, a, a horse is broken, and then he is willing to submit to the master. And that is the, that is what that means for us. We are willing to submit to the master, Jesus. So these are all emptying of ourselves because you can't fill what is still full. It's not going to a buffet and being full on McDonald's. You know, you need to empty yourself out before you go to a buffet or starve yourself a little bit, right? So verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So this hungering and thirsting is referring to longing for righteousness. And that is where we begin to desire that filling to take place. And whenever we go after that righteousness and we receive it from Jesus, we will truly find that satisfaction that only Jesus can provide. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So again, this has to do with the filling. Whenever you give mercy, Jesus gives it right back. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is the greatest reward that we could ever get in this life on this earth is to be able to see God and having a pure heart. It's very different from just simply cleaning off your heart or dusting it off. The having a pure heart means that you have embraced the Lord. It means that you are walking that straight and narrow path. You are honest. You are clear. You are undivided in your devotion to him. You are not distracted anymore by the ways of the world. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Notice the word peacemaker. This is very different from a peacekeeper. You can be a peacekeeper, but never make peace with people. So you could live in peace without actually making things right with people. You could still have bitterness in your heart, but be at peace with those people. That's very different from actually being a peacemaker, where you desire to get it right, where you desire to forgive people, where you desire to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry that I've hurt you, please forgive me. And whenever we make peace with others, that is when we are called sons of God. Why? Because God is saying, that is my son, that is my daughter who is made in my image and they are acting like me. They are reflecting my light. That is the people that God wants to declare. Those are my children. Nobody wants to look at the crazy kid running through the store wreaking havoc and say, that's my child. No one's gonna be proud to say that. Now, God never is not proud to call us his child. He loves us nevertheless, but he will be so proud to declare that we are his children when we are acting like him. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So remember I said yesterday, it is you are in good company when you are being persecuted for righteousness, not being persecuted because you're being weird though. I mean, this is you're acting in righteousness and it's just natural that the devil's going to come at you and he's going to bring all kinds of people to try to persecute you so that you will feel like you shouldn't be walking that path. So you're in good company and it is a good thing. Okay. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you're not only in the same company as Jesus, but also of the prophets who were also persecuted. And what I want to go back to here is in verse eight, when it says, blessed are the pure in heart. This is the goal of our relationship with Jesus is to get a heart that is purified. That's that whole regeneration and transformation that takes place. And the reward of seeing God, this should be our greatest motivation for purity. Not, I don't want to get caught. A lot of people start off not sinning because they don't want to get caught. They don't want to deal with the consequences. But really, when you get to this point of being motivated purely by, I want to please God, I want a pure heart, that is the best place to be in. And that is where you will start to really see God. You will really start to get revelation. You'll start to hear his voice more. You'll start to see him more clearly in the word because that desire to see him will be there. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Because if you really think about it, that makes sense, right? Salt loses its saltiness, how are you going to restore that? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So what good is salt? Well, salt was valuable back then. This was 
in some ways their money. They would use salt to be able to trade. Uh, salt promotes thirst, of course. It makes people thirsty. Well, in the spiritual sense, for the living water, salt preserves, it heals, and that starts with us as Christians. We should be the salt of the earth. We should be the people who are preserving righteousness and truth and also going out and attempting to get people healed, to love on them, to give them encouragement. So heal the world, you know, be a part of the healing of the world and also saltiness or salt adds flavor to food. So we should be people as Christians bringing goodness to people's life, adding flavor, not tearing down. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about adding flavor. That's what the salt will do and preserving and healing and promoting thirst after righteousness and goodness. You are the light of the world. Notice he doesn't say uh, that I'm giving you the light He is saying, you are the light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do the people light a lamp and then put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand so that it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, you need to let your light shine before others so that they will see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Now, some would say, well, this contradicts what the word says whenever it's saying, don't let people see what you were doing in public. You know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. But that's not what this is talking about. Whenever you have a right relationship with Jesus, his light will shine upon you and that will then reflect to the world. That's what this is speaking of. His character shining upon you and being reflected. Now, because we are to reflect that light, we've got to be careful of what gets in the way of that light. That is why we talk about you know, the world versus the spiritual life. If we allow the world to get in between us and the light of Jesus, the light of God, then that's going to cast a shadow and we won't be the light of the world anymore. So this is not about showing how good we are, but about how good he is. That's what it's all about, is reflecting how good our God is. And it is very intentional for us to be able to do that. As we behold the glory of the Lord, we will reflect his goodness. And notice that when Jesus did miracles, the people simply glorified the Father. You know, (laughs) Jesus didn't need to go post it on IG. He didn't need to go declare to the world, look what I just did, or ask for a selfie. You know, he didn't have to do stuff like that. His light simply glorified God in everything that he did. Now, I'm not saying don't post selfies or post things on IG. That's that's a tool that God gives us to use for his glory. But what's your intention and your motive behind posting it? Is it to bring glory to you or truly to bring glory to God? I mean, that's really what it comes down to on the everyday basis in everything that we do. What is your motive? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Fulfill means to fill out or expand or complete. That's why Jesus came to complete the law, to turn it inside out so that he could show his goodness. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. So he is saying, you can't get rid of the law. It isn't going away, okay, until it is accomplished. So that means this word until means that it will be accomplished. It will be completed and fulfilled. And to some degree, Jesus has fulfilled some of those prophecies and some of that law. He came to die for us, so therefore we no longer need the sacrificial system. He was the sacrifice. That's why we no longer adhere to the sacrificial system. However, it will be reinstated once again whenever Jesus rules on the earth in the millennial kingdom. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which, by the way, are the ones who were thought to be the only ones who were going to be able to go to heaven. That's what people thought back in the day. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Okay, this is the one that confuses a lot of people. Like, wait a minute. How are we going to have righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees? You know what this is telling you? You won't. You will never be able to gain enough righteousness to enter the kingdom of heaven without Jesus. We all need Jesus. The cross is a level playing field. It leveled out everyone. Everyone is on the same level when it comes to our eternal destination. 
The only way we can get there is through Jesus, period. So no one can keep these standards. So don't freak out as you read this. Remember I said keep an open heart, open ears to be able to hear the Lord's voice. This is a huge one right here to understand is that no one is going to be able to have that righteousness. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, so you've been taught, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Whoa. That again, very scary to hear, right? Now, this is not being angry at something. This is being angry with a person. Very different. Jesus was never angry with people. He was angry at the situations. He was angry at the sin. That is righteous anger, to be angry at a situation or at the sin rather than being angry with a person. Because when you're angry with people, that is typically what will then lead you to sin. It will lead you to wanting to be violent, to want to insult, to want to judge, condemn, all of those things. And he speaks about not insulting people. And this just comes straight out of the heart of God is to be kind to people. Don't call them fools. Don't call them, I mean, fools is a nice word and the standards of the world today, <laughs> you know? And I'm guilty of this, especially when I'm driving. <sighs> All right. I don't call people fools, but I have, I have innocent names that I call, but they're not innocent according to this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So does this mean that we can't ever come to the altar? We can't ever read the word of God? We can't pray until we go and make it right with somebody? Not necessarily. What this is saying is, Leave it at the altar. Take it before the Lord. Leave it there. Don't let it stand in the way of your time with God. So especially in your heart, make it right with your brother. Because if you sit here with all of that anger and bitterness in your heart, it's going to be very hard for Jesus to come and fill your heart with righteousness if it's filled with a bunch of bitterness, right? So this is especially what it's speaking of. Now, if you have the time and the ability and Jesus, Holy Spirit is telling you, go make it right with that person, you better go make it right with that person, <laughs> you know, because he's telling you to. But more than anything, it is getting it right in your heart here before you are able to then be open to receive from God. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So make peace because enemies can cause great damage to your life. And even if that means that you have been innocent in the matter, if they feel like they are an enemy to you, do what you can to make things right with them. And that might mean putting on a whole lot of humility and humbling yourself. Putting your spirit in prison is not worth it. And that is what this will do. If you maintain that enemy, your spirit will be imprisoned with that anger and bitterness and rejection. You have heard that it was said, again, they taught you this, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now this is not an excuse to say, well, I already looked at her so I may as well commit the act. I already thought about it, so I may as well do it. That is not what this is saying because these are not the same things. <laughs> it is still sin, so it's still, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. However, that is not the same thing and it is not an excuse to then go and continue in that sin. So feeding your mind with impure thoughts, it will ruin relationships. That is why there is constant preaching on pornography and why you shouldn't participate in it. And it ruins God's intention for marriage. God's intention for marriage was to be pure and was to be just between that man and that woman. And so whenever you start to allow different thoughts with other people into your heart and into your mind, well, that is where it will tear your marriage apart just as adultery would. So that's kind of what this is saying here is that it, it will be just as damaging. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Ouch. 
For it is better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. So is this telling you to truly gouge out your eye if you're if you do look at somebody? Not necessarily, but what it is saying is to cut off the thing that is causing you to sin. Cut it off, turn away from it, deal violently with anything that is making you sin or leading you down the wrong path. If it's an activity, if it is a hobby, if it is a person, if it is a job, a schedule, whatever it is that is leading you to that temptation, find another way, go the other route. You know, if you can get another job, do it. I don't know what that looks like for you, but deal with it because sin is so destructive so that we have to deal with it decisively no matter the cost. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, meaning premarital, extramarital, homosexuality, bestiality, pornography, it could be any of those things, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. People get hung up on this one too. Now, this is saying to commit adultery. If, if you have committed adultery, that was a sin, and I hope that you have dealt with it with the Lord. It is forgivable, okay? This is, again, not an excuse to go out and say, well, God's going to forgive me because that is then taking advantage of his grace. And that is rebelling, you know, against him knowingly. Now that you know this, that it was a sin and that you can deal with it and that you can be forgiven of it, this is not saying that you will continually live in adultery if you remarry somebody. It is you have committed it and God will deal with it. I believe, this is my belief. I believe that he restores, he redeems, and he turns all things for good. But it is an intentional making it right from this point forward and never going backwards again. Now that you know, you know, that's, that's what this was all about. When Jesus would preach something, he's like, listen, I am letting you know what I'm teaching you so go and sin no more. Look how many times he said that to people. So he dealt with the sin and he pushed them into righteousness. And I believe that that is for those who say, man, I, you know, I, I'm divorced, I'm remarried. What does that look like for me? Am I going to go to hell? No, <laughs> you're not going to go to hell, especially if you are making things right with Jesus at this point. All right. So we all need Jesus. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have been or what you've sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. Now, this is not God saying that oaths are not to ever be made. In fact, there are times when he talks about making oaths. What this is saying was, well, you have to understand the context. Back then, people would swear by the name of God in order to cover up what they were doing because when you swore by the name of God, it was then uh, bound legally. It was legally binding to do that. And some would use the Lord's name as a cover-up for their own falsehood in hopes of coming to an unbreakable agreement. So they would use it for their own twisting of what they were wanting to accomplish. And so that is why Jesus is saying, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't need to swear. If you're confident in your own conviction, you're not going to have to argue it. You can simply just say it and be at peace with it. So your actions should set the tone for the credibility of your words. You know, people shouldn't even question your yes and your no if your actions are able to stand up under it. You know, it's your ethics. So what, what are your ethics like? You know, what are your actions like? Are they displayed in such a way that it brings credibility to your words? Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is known as lex talionis. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So 
refuse to fight, you know, be a peacemaker, love back instead, because when you love back, it disarms the enemy. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Ah, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So typically the one who doesn't fight back, if you ever are in an argument and you are one who is a fighter, remember this verse and try next time this method of not fighting back, of maintaining your peace and watch how the control shifts. Not that you're trying to gain control here, because actually that's what fighting is always about. It's a control thing. But if you will you know, keep your peace and hold back, you will actually then gain control, but not in a way to try to manipulate that person. It is going to be a control that is set by God. And you are going to be able to control the words that you say. You are going to be able to control your actions and to actually control the tone of this fight. This was a huge lesson that I'm still learning. So the Lord wants us to have generous and compassionate attitudes in these very areas, physical attacks, legal suits, government demands, and financial requests. This is a hard one in these days, especially when demands from the government are becoming a little more oppressive, when legal suits are more and more and more out there. I mean, I, I swear people are getting sued left and right. Financial requests are all over the place. I mean, it's just a mess right now, this world. It is, plain and simple, physical attacks even. And so I guess we take it as a sign of, okay, Jesus knew we were gonna deal with this stuff and that is why he preached it. So hold on to this, to be that peacemaker, to be the one who is going to not fight back. There's a difference in defending self, okay? So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because you could really get into arguments and debates over this, but for the most part, if you are not being endangered in these kinds of things where you don't need actual physical help or, or legal help, then the general rule is to try to be peaceful. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, well, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This word perfect is referring to completeness. God isn't ever going to lower his standard of righteousness in order to accommodate our sin. So he gives us the power to be able to keep his righteous standard. If you look back on every sin that you have ever committed, you will likely see where you erred and where you could have gone a different route. It was always there. Jesus always provides that way out. It wasn't, I accidentally sinned. Sin is missing the mark, stepping over the line. Most likely, you had a way out. He will give us that power though, whenever we have him in us, when we have the Holy Spirit in us, to be able to maintain that righteousness. You'll know there will be a conviction there. So this isn't a call for us to actually be perfect because we know no one is. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. Everyone falls. No one is gonna get it right. The only person who did was Jesus. What this is intended to do, this Sermon on the Mount, was not to gain salvation, but how to live out the faith as a believer. And again, no one will ever meet the standards, so that is why we need Jesus. This whole sermon, these words are intended to point us to Jesus and it is for our good. These things, if we live this way, will give us a good, full, and satisfied life because the consequences that will follow are always going to be greater than if we did take the other route. So that's what we have to understand here when we read this. Don't look at it with the negative eye. Look at it with, oh, this is for my good. This is out of his love. He wants me to live this way because he knows it's the best for me. Chapter six, 
Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So again, this is all about our motives. What is your motive for doing whatever it is that you're doing? Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. So back in this day, whenever they were not able to make the trek to go give their sacrifice, what they would do is they would instead go out on the corners, street corners, blow a trumpet, and then all the poor would come to them and they would then hand out whatever it was that they were handing out to the poor good things, right? This is a good thing that they're doing, but they were doing it so that everyone could see how righteous they were. Like, look at what they're doing. Isn't that amazing? And they wanted that glory. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So this is all they're going to get. This is the best it's going to get for them is to get that applause from man, from people to look at them in a certain way. But when you give to the needy, notice it's not saying if you give to the needy, he's expecting it. When you give to the needy, if you're a disciple of Christ, you are to be a giver. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So when you give, do it in the right way. You know, don't try to call attention to yourself whenever you do it. And when you pray, again, an expectation here, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So as they were making their way to the temple, they would typically pray along the way to allow other people to see how spiritual they were. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him. So then pray like this. So this is where the Lord's Prayer is taught here. Now, we don't want to miss this promise, the fact that when you do these things, you will be rewarded. Some people look at the rewards and shun it because they're too worried about it looking like it's promoting the prosperity gospel. If, if we deny the rewards of God, we are denying the entire gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave. God's whole gospel is based on him giving to us. He created everything as a gift. Heaven, a gift. Grace, a gift. Salvation, a gift. Everything is a gift. Everything that comes from him is a gift. And so don't miss that, that he truly wants to reward you and that there is a reward waiting. You know, we have to recognize it. We don't use it as our motivation to be pure. Remember, our greatest motivation is to know him. But you still want to recognize it. Everybody wants to be rewarded. You're a liar if you say you don't want a reward. We live for rewards. We live for the good things that will happen. Nobody is walking this earth ex just wanting doomsday. You know, everybody wants goodness. And so sorry, I missed that. Coming back to the prayer though, what Jesus is about to teach us about the Lord's Prayer. He is saying here, listen, you don't need to inform the Father about anything. He already knows it. You need to just simply connect with him. That is what prayer is all about. You know, we don't need to demand our way. We don't need to tell him, oh God, did you see what happened today? Look at this, 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 and this. But it doesn't mean don't do that because if that is what it takes for you to commune with him and have conversation with him, absolutely talk to him about that stuff. But this is the best model to pray. This doesn't mean that you pray these words and only these words. This is simply a method of how to pray. So our Father who art in heaven, this is declaring who he is, who he is as a person. Hallowed be your name. You are holy. So every time I pray this prayer, you notice I kind of expand upon it. I'm doing that to help us understand what we're saying and to not just utter empty words because people will memorize these prayers and then they'll speak it without sensitivity and without meaning behind them. So your kingdom come, meaning we want your will, your purpose, Lord, as you have already purposed it in heaven before we were ever born. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts. So give us the exact provision that we need. This is referring to the daily manna he would give to the people in the wilderness. 
and forgive us of our debts. Pardon us of our sins, Lord. And we also, as we also have forgiven our debtors, forgiven those who have hurt us, who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation. So now we're asking for his protection, but deliver us from evil. So this is a model to pray with an engaged mind and sensitive heart. And how do you do it? You declare who he is. You ask for his purpose, his will to be done. You ask for provision and for him to forgive you. So that's that repentance and confession. And then ask for his protection to keep you on that road to righteousness, to be able to guide you along the way. You can pray all kinds of stuff, but this is a wonderful model to model after. But the point that he is driving home here is don't try to role play. You don't need to try to utter fancy words. You don't have to pray like a specific person. He just wants your heart. He just wants you to talk to him, but to understand who he is and who you are in that space. Verse 14, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Whoa, so forgiveness is imperative. And this is one that will trip a lot of people up because we will sit here and say, but I thought God forgives us of all sins. Well, he does. So what we need to understand from this is that if we don't forgive, remember, whatever measure you give to people, it will be measured back to you. So whatever you do, that is the way that you're going to be dealt with. So if you're not willing to forgive people with, or restore a relationship, that unforgiveness is going to create bitterness, anger, and resentment where you are unwilling to restore a relationship, ability to commune with people and fellowship with them. And so what that's going to do as a consequence is then keep you from having full fellowship with God. Because remember when we were talking about emptying yourself of bitterness, anger, resentment, and all the things in order to be filled by God, to be able to have that communion with him free and clear. But if you're holding on to unforgiveness, you are then not allowing God to be able to forgive you because you've got all that gunk within you, right? So I hope that makes sense. It's not that he's saying here, he's not going to forgive us, give you of your sins, so you're going to go to hell. <laughs> That's not what this is referring to. This is more of the responsibility that we bear to forgive others so we can then clear out the junk for Jesus to come and work on our hearts. All right, fasting, verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. So basically, again, the only goodness that they're going to get from fasting is going to be what they receive here on this earth if this is the way that they do it. If their motive is to be seen by others. Because remember, fasting is intended for the good of people. It is intended for you to be able to have direction from the Lord when you want to know something in his will. And it is for, you know, being freed up of something, for liberation. When you say no to hunger, when you are able to say no to that desire, you will be able to stand up under sin. It will liberate you from the hold that sin has on you. This is all part of fasting. So truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head with oil, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but only by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. I'm going to add that. So live for the reward, the heavenly reward. Now notice he keeps talking about hypocrites. Hypocrites comes from the Greek word uh, hypocrites, I think. And what that refers to is mask wearing. And if you remember the Greek plays that they would have, they had those uh, masks where they had those really animated faces for the different moods like anger or sadness or joy. And so it is basically where we get the term double standard or double life. And so these are people who are falsely claiming, they're like playing the role, falsely claiming to live by a standard in which they are unwilling to live by themselves. So it's that double standard. So playing a role with the world as their stage, but their only reward they're gonna get is that temporary applause from the audience. So don't live for that temporary applause, live for the heavenly applause, the heavenly reward. 
Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal. This term lay up means don't give priority to it. It doesn't mean give away all your riches and you know don't steward what you have and the money that you make. This is saying do not give priority to it. Don't make it a God. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, so make it your priority, the treasure and reward in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So it will be everlasting and incorruptible if you make the reward of heaven your priority over the things of this world. So basically, don't trust in the money, the riches, the success, the fame, or live for it. You know, don't be anxious about it. We are stewards of the gifts that God gives to us, and it's a beautiful thing if he does give you riches and rewards and success. That's not a bad thing. He wants to be able to give good gifts to us, but where's your heart in it? in the matter you know your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure so what is your heart treasuring today what are you pursuing why are you pursuing it what is your motive the eye is the lamp of the body so if your eye is healthy your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if then the light in you is darkness how great is the darkness so basically what are you looking at what are the things that you're setting your eyes to each and every day? What are you looking to? What are you looking for? What are you looking towards? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money uh, in Greek is mammon. And some people say Mammon was actually a pagan god, but really what it is is wealth personified. So you cannot serve the spirit of money and you cannot serve God at the same time. You're either going to serve one or serve the other. So if you serve God first and foremost, then your money will actually serve you. You won't be a servant to your money. And a lot of us have that backwards. We're more of a servant to our money, you know, with the with the monthly bills and this is a tough one because it's like well then where do I go from here how do I make this better that is a personal thing that you know you've got to deal with with God but make sure that your heart is to serve God first therefore I tell you and this is this is one of the greatest ways to do it right here do not be anxious about your life I think one of the greatest anxieties we have in life is about money what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So this is not referring to not being concerned. Godly concern is very different from ungodly concern. This is ungodly concern, untrusting worry. And he's saying, don't be anxious about anything. Pray about it all. You know, be thankful in all things. And that will lead to that carefree life because he will take care of you. He will provide for you. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your fa heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You are more valuable than birds, and he feeds the birds. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? I live by this one. Anytime I'm feeling anxious or worried about something, I, I think to myself, is my worry going to make this situation better? Probably not, right? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, meaning the non-Jews, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So basically what he's saying is, desire the righteousness of God's rule in your life. Have that single-mindedness on God alone, and then he will add these things to your life. Don't worry about these things. Worry first and foremost about your spiritual being. That's what's most important on this earth. Now, one thing to point out here is that you don't have to be rich in order to be able to give to God 
and you don't have to be rich in order to serve mammon. So we can't use the basis of, oh, well, I don't have money anyway, so I don't have to worry about this. The poor can be just as greedy or covetous as someone who is rich. So this is not speaking to a particular people, whether they're rich or poor. They speak to everybody because, you know, you can be the one who is anxious and worried and still be rich. You know, this isn't just speaking to poor people who are not knowing where their next paycheck is going to come from. This is talking about our spirit and the way that we approach life. So it's not necessarily about the physical all the time. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So he ends this chapter, even though he didn't, he wasn't actually speaking in chapters, but we end this chapter with the word that we don't need to have worries and anxieties about what's going to happen next. Worry about today. Deal with what is right in front of you. This is all part of the process of putting the right foot in front of the left foot with the Holy Spirit giving us one step at a time. If we're trying to leap ahead to what's gonna happen next month, all that's going to do is bring upon us sickness and stress because we do know that stress and anxiety and worry leads to physical illness. So this is why Jesus calls us to free ourselves of that because he knows again that it is for our own good. Chapter seven. Judge not that you be not judged. This word judge here in the Greek word is krino, which means to judge to the place of condemnation. I want to make a note here right off the top that as Christians, there is a form of judgment that has to take place. And because we're going to see it in these next few verses, that there's no way that you can determine something without having some sort of judgment. This is speaking of the type of judgment that is not fair and that does not use a standard in which you are willing to be judged by. It is the kind of judgment that is intended to tear down and intended to condemn people to the place of, you know, fault finding and pointing fingers. We should never have a spirit of fault finding. That is not our job as a Christian. Our job as Christians, yes, is to point out truth. So there is a sense of being able to discern goodness and evil, truth and false, but it is not to do it in a way that is going to bring people down. It's always to be out of love. It is always to just identify and then restore. That is our calling. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We were just talking about that. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So we talked about this yesterday. So again, if we are not willing to take part in a person's restoration, then that is a sign that you are most likely going for condemnation. If you're not willing to wash a person's feet, if you see dirt on their feet, and you're not willing to be like Jesus and wash that dirt off their feet for them, then you're probably not coming from a place of love and restoration. That's where our heart needs to be. It needs to be like Jesus's heart where he was willing to wash off the dirt. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is why David was always saying, create in me a clean heart, O God, and then I can teach sinners. Because he knows if God deals with him first, then he will be able to deal with others in a righteous way. Now, why is Jesus pointing this out? Because typically, whatever sin that you point out in others, oftentimes is the very one that you are struggling with yourself. So that is why we gotta deal with ourselves first. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So dogs and pigs are people who are enemies of the gospel. Don't even deal with them. That is what this is saying. Don't cast your pearls, your wisdom, your words, the word of God, the truth, before people like this. These are the type of people who are not open, not sensitive, not teachable, and are only arguing for the sense of arguing. There are people out there who need to be 
spoken to if they are teachable and willing and open to receive. But there are some people who will just keep arguing and arguing and arguing. Jesus is saying plain and simple here, don't deal with them. Don't cast your pearls before them. These are self-blind critics. Got a lot of those going on. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. This is a very persistent way to say, keep asking. Ask with confidence. Ask with humility. Seek with care and seek with a willingness to apply whatever it is that you get as an answer. And knock with an earnestness and with a perseverance. The whole point of us continuing to ask and seek and knock is not because Jesus wants to be hard-hearted and string us along. He may not answer us and he may want us to keep asking and seeking and knocking simply because he wants to develop us. He wants to develop our communication with him. You know, that is the whole purpose sometimes of him not answering is so we will continue to come. We will develop perseverance. We will develop the ability to pray. We will develop our trust and our faith. For everyone who asks, receives. Now, that looks different for everybody. It could be a receipt of a yes answer, a no answer, or maybe a not yet answer, or maybe you get it in eternity. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. You will get something out of asking, seeking, and knocking continually with the Lord. There is no way that you don't walk away from asking, seeking, and knocking with an earnest and humble heart and not walk away different and developed and better. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So if you know how much your Father loves you, then you will know that his desire is to give you goodness, to give you good gifts. See again, it's all about his giving to us. That's his desire. That is his heart. He wants to give. We don't live our life to get. We live our lives to give because our hearts are to be modeled after his. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Here's the golden rule. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. People get tripped up on this thinking, uh-oh, this means that very few people are going to go to heaven. This is not talking about heaven or our eternal destiny. A narrow gate, a gate is an entrance. It's an entryway. This is speaking about the entrance into a particular path. The one that is marked by difficulty, by persecution, that is a very narrow gate. It is a hard gate to walk into, but it leads to a greater reward. It leads to a greater destination. Whereas the gate that is wide open, you can do whatever you want, live however you want, live this easy road, you know, live as you please. Do you boo boo. That gate is very wide open for everybody. We all have a great wide open gate that we could walk through at any time. That is a very destructive road ultimately that you're going to walk down and the reward is not going to be so great in the end. So that is what this is speaking of. If you walk through the narrow gate, the one that is might be a little bit harder, might be more difficult, it is going to lead to life, whereas the other one that's wide open will lead to destruction. So I hope that makes sense. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. This all makes sense. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So this is one that people use to say, he's a false prophet, she's a false prophet, they're a false teacher. Some come asking, how do we know if they're a false teacher, false prophet? Well, look at their fruit, okay? So do they bear the fruit of the spirit? What is their spirit like? What is their heart like when they're delivering a message? 
And then you test them in their content. You know, what is their doctrine? You know, is it the word of God? Do they speak truth? Now, this isn't saying, do they make an error on interpretation of the truth? Because all of us will do that. I promise you. I have done it many times. And it doesn't mean that they won't grow in their interpretation of the word. Because we might learn something and learn it wrong. And then the Holy Spirit works on our hearts and we say, oh, actually... That's what he was saying. We have to unlearn what we were taught falsely. So these are some questions to ask. How do they live? Do they live a righteous life? Are they humble? Are they faithful? Is the content of their teaching man-based or is it Christ-centered? Are they simply teaching a feel-good message to tickle the ears of those listening? Are they just giving you know, self-help or are they centering it around Christ? Are they effective? Are the people who are listening to them and gleaning from them, are they growing in the faith or are they simply falling away eventually? So these are some of the things. This isn't, you know, the only thing that we test them by and is not one or the other? It's just some of the things you can consider whenever looking because you can't say, oh, I see them not being faithful. That must mean they're a false prophet or, ooh, look what they said on that sermon on that day. They're speaking falsely. They're a false teacher. You know, you can't pigeonhole them because they mess up on something or they do something, you know, pertaining to this. So just have discernment. Be prayerful about it. But really look at the fruit. The fruit is always going to tell what a tree is like at the root system. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So remember the other day I said, there, we're going to be surprised at some of the people we see in heaven and also be surprised at some of the people we don't see in heaven. And this is what we're talking about. There are people who will speak the name of Jesus and will declare that they are men of God, women of God, but aren't necessarily in fellowship and relationship with Jesus and have that right relationship. Is it for us to judge? No, that's for God to judge. But it is for us to discern whether or not we want to be a follower of a person like that. And so what this is saying is, yeah, there are going to be people who do miracles. Remember, it happened throughout the Bible where sorcerers and magicians were able to do different things that looked exactly the way that God's people were doing it didn't necessarily mean they were sent by God and that they had a relationship with God. So one of the ways to look at this is be aware of people who might constantly be self-promoting in their ministry. Uh, Because again, going back to the false teachers, the way that they are a false teacher is one, they're either lying in the way that they live or they're lying in what they're preaching. They are operating under the power of the devil, or they could very well be used by God in spite of their motives. You know, God, God may still very well use false teachers. So that's where we have to err on the side of caution when it comes time to looking at numbers. Like a, the, the numbers game is not necessarily the fruit. Remember I said it's, it's, it's the, the juiciness of the fruit. Like what does that fruit of that tree look like? What is the content of that, of that fruit? Everyone who then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. So again, this is being a hearer of the word, but also a doer. Because simply hearing the scripture is not equivalent to doing what it is saying. We must hear it, we must agree with it, and then put it into practice. And that is when our house, our temple, will be able to stand firm against the storms of life. I know it was a long one. I tried to be as concise as possible, but also be open-hearted in the sense that these are the words of Jesus. 
How could we ever look at an hour of our time and say, that was way too long? And thank God we have the opportunity to be able to pause videos, to come and go as we please. And so I think my heart is just to ask you to have grace for those who may need more explanation. Some of you all know this word in and out, and you know you might not want me to explain things over and over and over again, but my heart, it truly is for people who don't understand it to be able to understand it. And God's word is simple, yet it is so complex at the same time. And sometimes we can really unpack it and spend hours and hours and hours on it. But at the end of the day, Holy Spirit is going to have his way. No matter how much we talk, no matter how much explaining we do, it could just be one simple word that he throws at you and says, this is what I'm speaking. This is what I want you to think about. This is what I want you to pray about. And so I hope you were able to hear his voice today in this message. These are the most profound words that came out of Jesus' mouth. And these are the scriptures, these are the chapters that really we should be diving deeper into and we will at some point. But for now, we're just skimming the surface. But that doesn't mean that God isn't going to use it powerfully. He is, he does, and he will. Because he did on that day when he spoke to the disciples on that mount. And he is still doing it today as he speaks to us through this Bible study or through our own personal time of reading the word of God. And don't be discouraged if maybe something didn't speak to you. I promise you that your faithfulness in reading this word today it will come up once again. Something's gonna happen down the road and you're gonna say, oh, I remember that we read about that. So this is why we store up the treasures of heaven in our hearts. This is why we lay up the treasures of the word of God in our hearts so that we are then able to hold on to it and apply it to those times in life where it becomes a little bit rocky, a little bit difficult, but that is all part of building that foundation so that our house can stand. So thank you, Lord, for this word. We could sit here and talk all day with you and pray all day and speak all of the different sayings, the jargons, God, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to do right now in the here and the now is simply lay at your feet our thoughts, lay at your feet our worries, our anxieties, whatever it is, God, that you are wanting to minister to us. I pray that you will do so now. May our hearts be open to it as we empty everything out before you and allow you to have your way. My prayer here today, Lord, is that you will do that, Lord, that you will do a work in every person who has come here faithfully today to hear your word and to be in prayer and in communion with you. So as we do this, Lord, will you start to minister? Will you start to work in a powerful way, in a way that only you can? There's nothing that I can say here today, Lord, that is going to do what your spirit will do within a person. So have your way today, we give you full permission. And we are gonna take this time, these next few minutes, to just be still before you. We love you, Lord, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. And I encourage you to do that. If you are here, to continue to just be silent before the Lord. So pause the video here, have that communion with him. And if you have not received Jesus, we are going to say a prayer, so please allow the video to continue. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. 
So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.